you guys put me in this terrible situation. You didn't pay me the money you told me you were going to pay me. And now you're looking at me going, well, maybe we should just move you out of this situation. And I'm just like, I just got here. Like it's like three months, right? All of the people that work for me that have now quit are in apartments that they have leases till for an entire year. Like you have completely screwed everybody, right? And I like I'm at I'm up to here in debt at this point, right? Like I wasn't making any money either. And they're standing in the corner giggling at me, going, Well, you're clearly not doing the right things. Like it's just because you won't listen. And I'm just like, sure. So then I started listening and then it just went from bad to worse as all of the companies are filled up with those executives until they die. The promise of being promoted to that level is not there. It doesn't exist Um, because being an owner, I've seen it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't exist because there are so many holes you got to jump through to get there. Um, And half of it is people leaving. Like you need people to leave in order for you to get to those situations. Um, And if they don't, you're never going to get there. Okay, let's get into it. Um, So about eight months ago, I did an interview with a guy named Dan, who was a former owner in uh, Smart Circle. And one of the things that he said in his interview was that he wishes that more owners would speak out uh, about their experiences. And Chase, you are one of those people. When you reached out to us, it was right after Dan's interview went live, and that part especially spoke to you. You felt that you had a certain responsibility as a former owner to come forward and talk about your experiences. So my first question is, why did that kind of request from Dan, that wish from Dan's interview, have such an effect on you? Um, You know, I think what it was, was I was just... I saw that video um, just after um, I had kind of stepped away or, you know, we had a mutual parting of ways, I guess we could say, and I was done out of the business. And, um, you know, I was just reflecting on my time there, right? Um, and I was sent the link from from just a, a previous employee that I'd, I'd been friends with, they had worked for me and, you know, no big deal. I, I've got nothing against that stuff. so. I just had a look at it, um, you know, because I was intrigued by it, you know, just wondering what the whole thing was, because I'd never heard of your page to begin with. Like, that was the first time I'd ever seen it. Um, and just hearing him talk about all the things that he went through. Um, and it just kind of really made me feel like, just like him, I was taken advantage in several different ways. And that I don't want other people to be taken advantage of like that. I at least want them to know what they're getting themselves into. And if they make that decision, then at least it's not on them. Uh, at least it's on them. And, um, you know, they know that they're making the decision that they're making, um, you know, and, and Dan just sounded like the type of guy that I could like sit down and have a conversation with. He reminded me of a few different owners that I ended up coming in contact with. And I was like, you know what? I think I've got a moral responsibility as a person um, just to make sure that there are other people in this world not making the same mistake that I did. Sure. I mean, you can't make somebody do something. You can't prevent physically prevent somebody from getting involved in this but as long as they have good information and they make the choice on their own Mm -hmm. that's one thing that is being completely deceived by these companies which i'd say probably about 99 percent of people are absolutely so when you reached out you told us that you were uh, you were there for three years correct and you did make owner and your case is interesting because i'm similar to dan's too because he worked for a couple different arms of devil corp yeah. As did you. You actually worked for three, SIDCOR, right. Smart Circle, and OSP, which is new to us, which we'll talk yeah. about later. Yep. Um, you know, the, the one of the defenses that these companies use when they are questioned, rightfully so, that, hey, these companies that that Slave Circle page talks about and the companies that that Devil Court page talks about sounds a lot like your company, but they'll they'll deny it and say, oh, either we're not affiliated with Sidcor or Smart Circle, or or th- there are brokers. That's how they get we get our clients. You know, some yeah. some line like that. Yeah. What similarities and I guess differences did you notice? Can you remember from Sidcor versus Smart Circle versus OSP? Um, well, so it's actually kind of funny. So when I started off at Sidcor, it's funny you bring up Devil Corp because obviously there's that web page, right? Um, within the first two weeks, 
I hear about it. Right. And I, you know, um, I talked to a bunch of different people who was like, Oh, it's nothing. Like it was just a jaded employee. Like, you know, Google's a bathroom wall and like, I'm a smart guy. So like, I take everything with a grain of salt because there are people that are jaded and do make things up and exaggerate details. And I'm just like, Oh, you know, it's whatever. I mean, I'm enjoying my time here so far. So, you know, I'm not going to judge a book by its cover. And then, um, but Sidcore is exactly what everybody says it is. Like anything you've ever read about Sidcore is so true. Now there are people in Sidcore um, that, you know, aren't bad people, but the system as a whole, definitely a problem. Um, then I go to Smart Circle um, and I feel bad for a lot of people that, cause I've watched all your episodes. So after I saw Dan's, I went all the way back to your first episode and I literally watched all of them. Cause I just needed to see like, you know, cause I was up a lot of levels more than other people, like, you know, ownership kind of is quote unquote, an exclusive group of people and not everybody hits it. And I just wanted to know like what these people went through and how they went through it and like how terrible it was for them. And I didn't have a bad experience at smart circle. It was kind of weird. I went from SIG core to smart circle and I, I honestly enjoyed almost every minute that I was at smart circle. I think the only thing I didn't enjoy was my promoting owner before I got promoted. Um, she, for the lack of a better term, emotionally, like just took advantage of me. So obviously I gave you my background and I'm a professional athlete. So sometimes people like make fun of professional athletes because we're very good at people can like talk down to us and be mean to us. And it's almost like fuel and you use it inside of you and you just, it takes it to the next level. And that's what my promoting owner did. So she didn't, if she felt she wasn't getting enough out of me, that's what she would do. And I never really enjoyed that part of it. Um, but then when I went to OSP, it was a complete joke. Like the whole time I was there, it was like, I was back at Sidcor. like literally OSP, the people that work at OSP are people that used to work at Sidcor, like verbatim, like people left Sidcor to go work at OSP because they think that OSP is different. And trust me, if you look up OSP, it looks very different, but it's not, they, they have a section that does exactly what all the other companies do. OSP is very good at, they have um, some professional ties in the sports world. So they make it look like they do a whole bunch of things and they do. It's not that they don't, but that one arm is still the exact same. They still con people. They still screw people. They screwed me hard and they never will admit it. Obviously it'll always be my fault. Um, but it was kind of funny. I went to Sidcore and it was just as bad as everybody said it would be. And then I loved it at smart circle, but like all of the things are the same, like the buzzwords and the way you get promoted. And, you know, they always just say we're different, right? Sidcore, smart circle and OSP just we're different. We're not the same you know, this is different. That is different. Um, you know, the eight great work habits are the same. They might call them something different, right? The five steps to a conversation, they might call it something different. It's the same, right? Um, and that acronym that we use, um, oh, uh, the four, oh, Fuji. I can't remember. Yeah, Fuji. Fuji. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People, same thing. Like they might change the acronym or change the words. It's all the same right? And they say they're three different companies. They're all born from the same, like five people, which everybody yeah. knows, you know, if they don't know that story, um, that's a story for another day, but um, it all comes from the same place. Um, you know, but Sidcore and OSP, it was the exact same. Um, but it's tough for me to say, like, I feel bad for the people that were in the smart circle system, because I don't really have a lot bad to say about smart circle, um, mm -hmm. because the organization that I was in, um, Set, did separate themselves in a lot of different ways. And we did a lot of good things. Um, but then at the end of the day, after I finished, um, I kind of did a little more digging and figured out that it wasn't nearly as good as I thought it was, but I definitely had a better experience at smart circle than I did at OSB and Sidcorp. The journalist in me has to ask this, um, question. Mm -hmm. Um, before we started this conversation, you had, you actually said the word jaded Yeah, that you, you felt jaded to mm -hmm. and probably that's a nice way of, of describing your attitude yeah yet you also just said that you know the the the, the defense mechanism against devil corp is well that's just a jaded employee right and i know that the people the, the people that i know follow my channel that are very very pro these companies yeah 
um, will use that as a, you know, oh, he's just jaded. He's a failed owner because that's another very common reply. So what makes, why should we trust you that you're not just this jaded failed owner looking to besmirch this wonderful set of companies? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, my biggest thing I say to that is the people that hired me at all three of those companies, if you Google me um, and you look up things where I went to school, um, you know, I was a professional athlete before I ever started working in the real world. Like there are things that I've achieved in my life that nobody could ever just hand me. I had to work for every single thing that I got and it's all on the internet. So it's not like it's a lie. You can Google my first and last name. You can see all the things that I've done in my life. Um, and that's how I achieved the things that I achieved through these three companies, um, even trying to do it the right way. And that was the tough part is that I was doing it the right way and I still got treated the way that I got treated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's a tough part. And you know, what's funny is, is I say that I'm jaded, but I wasn't jaded until after I left. Like OS, like, because I'm a professional athlete, I'm always like this type of like system is so perfect for athletes to get sucked into because at the end of the day, when you're at a high performing level in a sport, it's always on you. It's never on anybody else. It's always just you. And it just stops with you. All the companies, they do the same thing. It's always your fault. It's you're something you're not doing that is your fault. And I'm always the first one to go. It's my fault. I'm there's not, there's something I'm doing that is wrong and I need to fix it. So the whole time, the whole three and a half years that I was doing this, I was like, it's your fault. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. I'm being told by these people around me that are super successful. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. I'm like, yeah, they're right. Because clearly they're in a position that I need to be in. And if I was doing the right things, I would already be there. And I did that for three and a half years. And then I watched Dan's video and it rattled me. And I went, you know what? maybe because I'm in my own worst critic. Like if you talk to any of my friends, my family members, they're like, you are so insanely hard on yourself at every single day on every single thing. Like sometimes you just need to relax. And Dan just kind of rattled me and made me realize that like, okay, maybe I'm not the only one, right? Because everything around me was showing me that I was the only one that was the problem. And then I saw Dan and I heard what he said. And then it made me go back to the very beginning of your Um, subscription and watch all of the videos. And I realized that, well, okay, maybe it wasn't just me. And then that's when the jadedness started. It wasn't, I was jaded when I was in there. I loved everybody. Everybody was great. You know what? I made some mistakes. I should have done this. I should have done that. And then it wasn't until after I left that that self-reflection happened. I didn't leave because I was jaded. I left and then became jaded afterwards. Right. Which I think are two very different things. I think there are people who leave they get jaded because they're in it and they hate it. And then there are people like me that like, I was trying to be the best owner in the country the entire time and nobody was going to stop me. Mm -hmm. And then the end happened. And then I saw Dan's video and then I became jaded, right? Which at the time I wasn't even an employee anymore. I was just a normal person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So let's go through this. Um, Like you said, you have a lot of experience in um, a lot of these different places, Mm -hmm. which is is unusual because most of the time I get contacted by people, they know, well, I was with Smart Circle, I was with Credico, I was with APCO, whatever. But your initial run-in with this, with Devil Corp was with Sidcor, Right. Which I, I think just based on all the interviews I've done, I feel like Sidcor gets the worst rap out of all of the parent companies because they don't, they don't pay their employees. They constantly lie about hourly versus uh, commission. And just based on your email, it it basically says that they took advantage of you. And you already said in this interview that you absolutely hated. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Like that's, that's a perfect way to put it. (laughs) So let's take me through your time at Sidcor. You said you were there for a year. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that's a good amount of time to give to anything. So for at least a certain amount of time, it looked like this is pretty cool. You got promoted. You went through the ranks at Sidcor. So what what take me through that Sidcor journey, uh, the good and the bad? Yeah. So um, from the very beginning, it was it was not good. So um, I, I'm not sure if I included it in the email, but um, so I, I graduated in December of 2018. 
Okay. Um, and I've, I'm Canadian. So, um, when I came out of school, I, I didn't have a visa. So the way it works is when you graduate as an international student in the United States, you pretty much get a freebie of a year. So you can go work for whatever company you want. The stipulation is, is whatever company you sign with and they have to sign the papers, you have to be with them for a year. And if at any point in time you quit, lose your job, get fired, whatever, you have to go back to the country you're from. Yeah. Right. So I'm looking for a job going through all these different things. And I was contacted by a company in Maryland and I was definitely looking to leave the area that I was in. Right. Um, and so I was looking in the Northeast, you know, just trying to get anything, maybe something in New York, maybe something around DC, that area. Um, and I got contacted by this company in Maryland and it was a small company. Um, and at this point, I didn't know about Devil Corp. I didn't know about Sipcor, like any of any of that stuff. And um, they portrayed themselves as a small company that dealt with um, tech companies and that was, you know, so like AT&T, T-Mobile, um, Sprint, Verizon, um, and that you were doing, um, for the lack of a better term, like consulting, right? Um, and they would bring you in and they would teach you all these different things about the companies um, and then, you know, how you help them and made their practices better. And I was like, well, that sounds kind of cool. And so I look up the company, right? There's nothing out of the ordinary about the company. They have a website, they have a list of employees that you can see, the people that are running the company, the CEO, you know, nothing looks out of the ordinary because I'm definitely doing my research. Every single company that I had an interview with, I'm looking them up on Google, trying to figure out what they do, how they do it. Um, so nothing out of the ordinary, right? So I do a phone interview um, and then I do an initial interview over Zoom like this. Um, it's about 45 minutes long and they're answering all my questions. I'm like, okay, you know, seem, this seems to line up. This seems to line up, okay. We're talking about money, salaries this much, blah, 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 blah. I get told it's going to be $60,000 a year. Me being an ex-professional athlete, I'm okay. So I'll get paid once a month. That's totally fine. No big deal with that. Um, you know, and so I accept the offer at the end of the day um, and they sign my papers, right? So I'm committed to this company for a year. Yeah. I get there first day and I remember it. <laughs> it was the day after Valentine's Day, um, 2019. And I get there and they just had a horrible snowstorm. Um, and I go to work, right? My first day and I'm in a shirt and tie, right? Like I'm in a suit because like I'm going to the office, right? Going to start my, you know, new job. Not really sure what to expect. Um, and so the first, you know, few hours I'm, I'm in there and I'm, you know, getting orientated by one of the employees at the time, um, which was obviously, um, you know, I go to learn that that's like a leadership position, right? Um and they hand me these papers, right? And I'm flipping through them and I'm like looking and there's like a pitch in there and I'm just like, I'm reading, like this is the first couple hours and I'm going, there's a pitch, like I'm not selling stuff. Like I accepted this job because this is a consulting firm. Like I'm gonna, you know, learn a bunch of stuff about tech companies. And this is the first couple hours and my mind is just going through all these different things. And I'm just like, well, this seems odd. Well, you know, when I meet with management, they'll probably explain like, you know, this is, however they want to do it. Right. And I'm just like making up stuff in my head going, well, they're going to explain it. It's okay. Like don't jump to conclusions. Right. Um, it's okay. It's only your first couple hours at this new job that you're going to be at for a year. Um, and so the whole time we're in, you know, the atmosphere room, right. Like I'm just sitting in a chair with somebody else. Right. Um, and there's like games and stuff. And I'm just like, this, is, this seems just, it seemed odd. I didn't think it was weird. Like I know a lot of people say it's weird, but it just seemed odd, but I wasn't like, again, I'm not writing them off because America's full of so many different things. I'm from a different country. So I'm not trying to judge at this point. Right. And so a couple hours goes by, I'm seeing a lot of interviews go through the door. They told me that I went through this extensive interview process and I'm going, if I went through this extensive interview process, why are all these people coming through the door? Yeah. Right. Like this doesn't make any sense either. And so of course I finally get to sit down with management which is the guy that's going to train me, which also happens to be the CEO. <laughs> um, so we spend like two hours together and he's talking to me about all these different things. Um, and he's like, all right, well, we're going to get to work. So let's go grab some lunch. And I'm like, all right, cool. So we go grab lunch. Um, and he's like, all right. So, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And I'm like, all right, I'm looking forward to it. We'll head back to the office and, you know, get started with the rest of the day. Um, and we go for lunch and then he just, so we start driving and I'm new to Maryland. Like I've never seen anything. So I have no idea where we're going. Right. I think maybe we're going to a different office or whatever we're doing and we're going to a residential area. And I'm thinking, I'm going, this can't be 
I was like, no way. Like, there's no way. There's no possible way I just signed up for a contract with a company that I'm going to be stuck doing sales door to door with. And I'm getting more nervous as we're going. I'm getting more nervous as we're going. We get out of the car and he goes, um, so did you bring walking shoes? And I was just like, no, you didn't tell me to, what? We're supposed to be working in an office, right? And he goes, well, it's door to door. I told you that like a month ago. And I'm just like, <laughs> are you kidding me? And so of course I spend the rest of the day, right? In a shirt and tie, like I took my tie off and took my jacket off, but I'm in the sun, like, it was probably 65 degrees out that day, um, which was really weird because it snowed the day before, but um, it was nice out the next day. And so I'm walking around in dress shoes and dress pants and a dress shirt. And he's showing me how to do this with direct energy, which just so everybody knows, direct energy is literally the worst company in America. They <laughs> screw everybody over um, and they're terrible. So my problem was I was stuck there for a year now. If I quit, like they, it was already signed on the dotted line. Yeah. The university re re revokes my visa and I'm in ship back to Canada, right? And I, and at this point, I don't want to go home. Like I put in all this effort for my degree and I'm like, I can't, I can't just give up on this because I don't like it. And I just, I tried to think to myself, you know what? Everybody's gone through hard things in their life that they have to battle through. You did it when you played hockey. It's okay to do it now. Just get the job done. It'll be okay, right? So I just put my head down. It was not fun. I hated every day. Anybody that wants to tell any different, not cool. Um, Direct Energy deliberately had meetings with us where they deliberately told us to make it sound like they would say that they thought that they were telling us the truth, but they were knowingly deceiving the employees, telling us to say things that weren't actually true. Like I would look them up on the internet and be like, well, that was a lie. That was a lie. So the whole time we're having these meetings with Direct Energy for an entire year, I was trying to retrain all the employees to say different things because I didn't want them lying under my watch. Like I was one of the managers yeah. and I didn't want them lying to people. And I would personally, like, I'd go to doors and I would lose sales because I would tell people the truth. I'd be like, look, this is what's actually happening. And the only reason why they would sign up with me is because I was a nice guy, right? And I'm fortunate to have just a little bit of charisma. So they'd be like, you know what? You told me what was going to happen. I appreciate it. It's still going to help my bill. So I'll do it. But there were lots of people like I would get yelled at because I'm just like, well, I lost this sale. And, and I wasn't shy about it. Like I would tell my CEO what I did because I'm not going to be dishonest. Like I'm not physically going out and going to lie to people. They need to know the truth and they're either going to do it or they're not. Right. And mm -hmm. so I went through an entire year of that. And at about month seven is when I was on my push to management. Um, and oh man, um, I was on my push to management. And there was always something that was preventing me from getting there. My CEO, um, so at the time, so, and this is just vintage Sidcor, right? We were in a building with two owners, okay? So the one owner was in one corner, my owner was in the other corner, and we shared an office space, right? The office space is beautiful, and everybody thinks this is a professional job, and here we are playing two ball in the middle of the office, right? There's no chairs, no nothing, right? Yeah. And I had a big team. I had 12 people on my team. Um, and we had, you, you know, those fam, uh, those team nights they talk about, right? They're so sure. awesome. Um, so we had a team night, right? Um, and I was the type of guy that I would do anything for people on my team. And so there were quite a few, probably four or five people on my team that didn't have cars. And it was actually kind of perfect because work was in Virginia. And I could pick them up all along the way to go to work. So it wasn't a big deal. So I literally, I would do anything for my team because as a hockey player, that was, I was a team guy, right? So I did whatever I could to win. And if I was going to get promoted, I knew those were the sacrifices I had to make anyways, right? And so there were four or five people that didn't have a car. And I was, I think it was about, I was a week shy from getting promoted. So like the numbers were there, you know, they tell you this, this amount money, this many people, blah, blah, blah. And I'm right there, right? So we have a team night. The whole team is there in both offices, whatever else. So obviously I can't drive everybody home. So my CEO comes along. He's with nobody. And I had specifically asked them, can you drive these people home? Because I've got to take X, X, and X home, right? So that night, he takes the three of them and drops them off at a railway station, like the, the city transit or whatever. And we're in Maryland. The three of them live in Virginia. So like, and this is, you know how team nights are, right? People tell you like they go to like 10 or 11. 
Like this is late at night and they've got to be at work the next day, right? I don't find out until the next morning, everybody quits. Those two people nagged out a whole bunch of other people, told them what happened. This person quits, that person quits and I'm done, right? So now my push is over, right? And then so all these people leave and my owner, of course, is like, oh, don't worry about it. And I'm sitting there going, this is your fault. And he goes, no, it's not. They just weren't prepared for this. And I'm just like, you're not man enough to admit that you made a mistake, right? And he just keeps telling me it was on me. You didn't do this. You didn't do that, right? So now another two months goes by, right? At the time, me and my fiance, we had booked um, a trip to go on a cruise, right? It's a, it was a year away. How am I supposed to know that I'm going to be on another push to management, right? So I've got like 15 people on my team. Again, I'm, a, I'm literally two weeks away from getting promoted to ownership. I'm leaving for two weeks, okay? So all they got to do is just keep these people there and I'm, I'm set. I come back and everybody's gone. The, like I had two or three core people, like we were all like best friends and we just stayed there. Like, and we had serious conversations like, this sucks and I know you hate it and trust me, I hate it too. But look, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we're going to get there. So we more so committed to each other. It was those three people and me and everybody else was gone. And I was like, where's everybody go? And then they literally just told me two weeks of things that happened that was almost like deliberately them demolishing the people that I had around because I was better as a cash cow for them to make them money so that they wouldn't go out of business because they're not going out to the field, right? Like the owner's like, I'm sitting pretty when he's like, his car's broken. Like, it's so funny how many stories I heard where like the CEO has a worse car than me, right? Um, and he's the, the only reason why he's staying in business is because of me, yep. right? And I pretty much ran the company for six months. Like he did nothing. Like I ran all the meetings. I recruited all the people. I did all the interviews, all that stuff. And he just hung out, mm-hmm. right? And then of course, when things wouldn't go well, he's sitting there doing this right? Pointing fingers, right? And so we come around all the way, right? So those people leave in December, right? So now I'm back to three or four people or whatever it is. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to do it again. So January comes around, okay? And then February comes around. So my visa expires exactly one day less than a year, right? Which is February 12th of the next year. So what happens is if that visa expires, And the thing that was great is it was just a perfect storm of a bunch of things. Trump got elected president. So he changed all the immigration laws. So as soon as my visa expired, if I didn't have already like a new one, I was getting deported. (laughs) And so that was the thing. On top of that, um, I was in an accident in July um, and um, my court hearing and everything was happening then. Um, And everybody can Google that. Um, They can see what happened. I don't need to talk about it on here, Um, but Um, that happened. So that was happening in February. Um, And so, and my visa was obviously expiring. So all these things are happening once and I needed a lawyer and my CEO. So this is, this happened back in July and my court hearing was starting in January of 2020. And my CEO told me that he would cover everything that I needed. Right. As I called him when it happened, I said, dude, I'm in a lot of trouble. Like, I don't know how, like I need to afford a lawyer and I need a good one because I need to make sure that nothing bad is going to happen. And so he said, I got you, whatever it is, five, six, seven, eight thousand $8,000, whatever it was perfect. So I literally got the best lawyer in that part of Maryland. And it was, there was a $5,000 um, retention fee. Um, and he kept giving this lawyer the runaround. And it got to the point where the lawyer was like, you told me your company was going to cover this. And the lawyer literally had to pass me to somebody else because like, look, your, guy, your CEO is just messing with me and it's always something else. And I don't have time to deal with this. And this guy is very recognized like in that part of Maryland. Mm-hmm. So he's a pretty big deal. And so I'm insanely embarrassed. And then he passes me off to somebody else, which was also a very good lawyer, which is the lawyer I retain now. Um, and still, so now the deal changes and he goes, I'll pay for half of it. And I'm just like, what do you talk, what do you mean half? You told me full, you said, whatever I needed, you would take care of. And he's like, no, 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 no. I'll pay for half. Like ignoring the fact that he even said that he's like, nah, we're just doing 50% now. And then it got to a point about a month later and he goes, look, whatever I pay for, you need to pay me back. And I'm like, why is this changing? Like who owns a company says they have all this money and then looks at me and goes, well, if I pay for it, you got to pay me back. That's not a thing. 
That's like when I played professional sports in Switzerland and they paid for my apartment for the entire year and said, oh yeah, by the way, if you ever leave the team, you owe us all of that money. <laughs> like that, that just doesn't happen, right? And so that was essentially the last straw, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just going, okay. So, and then the thing that broke the camel's back was they were telling me the whole time they were going to get me a visa, right? They were going to be like, we'll get you an H-1B, we'll get you an H-1B, we'll get you an H-1B. And like January's coming, and then February's coming and still nothing. Right. And I'm going like, this isn't enough time. Like this is, you know, a process. Right. Um, and so, you know, my court hearings coming up and um, you know, my visa deadlines coming up. Cause I got to figure out like what I need to do. Right. Because if they're not going to help me, like I also got to do how, whatever I need to do to stay in the country. Um, and I cornered him in his office. This was the day I quit. Okay. So I've been here for almost a year. And this is the day I walked away. I go in his office and I exploded. Like, I was just like, look, like you made all of these promises to me. You lied about all these different things. And now you're telling me that you're not going to give me a visa. And you've said for six months that you're going to give me a visa. Like, what is going on? I kid you not. He sat in his chair and he started crying. He literally broke down in front of me. And he finally admitted the fact that he had no money. The only reason why anything was happening was because of me. And he didn't know how to deal with the fact that like I got into an accident and I needed a lawyer and he couldn't afford it because he wasn't making any money, which I mean, that's not my fault. You never went out to the field. So I don't feel bad for you. <laughs> right. Um, because, you know, as an owner, like you've heard all the other people, you kind of never get out of the field anyways. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and so he finally breaks down and I just, I said, look, dude, I said, if you're not going to come through on any of this, I mean, clearly you've made some bad decisions. And I, I'm not like, I can't do this anymore. Right. So I, I literally quit that day, which was not what I was trying to do. Like I did not go into work that day going, I'm going to quit. Right. Um, and he has the audacity to look at me and go, can you just do me a favor and not talk to every single person in that office had either been initially interviewed by me or had been hired by me. There are like 20 people in the office and he literally goes, can you do me a favor and just give me your iPad and don't talk to anybody as you leave? And I was just like, how dare you? Like, I'm pretty much the reason why your company is even alive right now. And you're going to tell me that all of these people that I just spent time, like putting relationships and time in and not getting any sleep and having all these conversations with, now you're going to look at me and tell me, don't talk to any of them as I walk out of the office and they look at me and they heard me yelling like, you know, my voice carries. <laughs> they heard me yelling in the office. Like they know that something happened. Right. And I handed him my iPad and I go to walk out and people are like, what's going on? I said, ask him, ask him. And I just left. Right. And the sad part was, is I had all these connections at Sidcor, and it's like, you quit and you don't exist anymore. Yep. Right. And it's like the people that were talking to you before, they don't talk to you anymore. Right. Um, you know, the owners that were like, you're the next big thing, which I was, uh, you know, I think the term for it is crushing it. <laughs> um, and all of the big people, like the people in devil court that like are super important people. I broke bread with those humans. Right. And everybody knows who those people are. I broke bread with all those people. And they're like, you're the next big thing. Like this guy says so many great things about you. This girl says so many, like everybody just going, you're the thing, you're the thing, you're the thing. And then it's like, okay, cool. So I developed all these and I developed personal relationships with these people too. Like not just work relationships, but I sat down with them and had drinks with them and it, nothing work related, right? Just as humans. And it's like, you don't even exist anymore, right? And so that happens. Um, and then so I, my fiance at the time, we hadn't planned on getting married. And I went, so we've got two options. <laughs> got, I gotta go back to Canada. Or I'm getting deported or we're getting married. Yep. And she goes, well, neither of those other two things are going to work. So let's go to the house. <laughs> so literally, um, which is just, so, it's such a funny story. It's terrible. But like literally the next Monday, we went to the courthouse and filed for a marriage certificate. We got it on a Wednesday. We got married on a Thursday. And then literally I applied for my visa a day before it, because the way it works is, after Trump got elected and he changed those immigration laws, your visa application has to be in and it has to be processed before the date that your visa expires. One day 
one day before my visa was set to expire, it got processed. So I was able to stay in the country. So we're fine now. I'm a permanent resident, no issues. So obviously it takes some time because when you process to get a visa, you get, um, you get a temporary work visa. So obviously I couldn't work at that time. So um, I was like four months. There was a gap of just me kind of hanging out and COVID obviously hit that next month, right? So everything just goes into chaos and we're like, okay, so what are we going to do? I probably can't get a job anyway. So, you know, I just kind of hung out at home and, you know, my wife was still working because obviously, you know, thank goodness she's a nurse and she worked so hard. So, um, you know, she was working a lot at that time and um, around comes June and I just started getting my temporary visa and um, started applying for more jobs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, the one thing that SIGCOR did help me with is it definitely helped me pad my resume because I was able to put a whole bunch of things on there that like look impressive. Yeah. But probably aren't. Don't mean anything, but yeah. <laughs> they the look impressive, good. But they probably aren't, right? Um, and so I put them on my resume because it was the only work experience that I've had in America because like the top work experience, I'm a professional athlete. Like yeah. people are like, oh, that's great. But in America, nobody cares because they're like, well, you haven't like had a job. And I'm just like, I don't know. I got money to play sports. That's not, not a job. <laughs> like that's still a job, but it's not the kind of job that they care about. Right. And so I was like, well, at least I got a year of that. And there's lots of people obviously you've interviewed that have said that, right. That, well, at least I got the experience and everything else. Right. Um, so it was on there. And um, this time I got real smart. I hired a recruiter, right. Um, from LinkedIn and she had, you know, a lot of really good clients. So I'm like, perfect. She helped me find a really good job. So um, it narrowed down to three. Um, so this is when I found out about Smarser. <laughs> so okay. I went in for an interview with this company and they were in Maryland um, and they were in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I went to that interview and I don't, have you ever seen the promotion book, like the CEO book that you get as an owner? No, no. Okay. So just a, a very vague description. It's like um, there, there's a binder and then it's inside of like this black case that's gold trim. Um, and you pull it out of like another box. Okay they all look the same for all the companies because they all go through the same company to get incorporated. So whether you're at OSP, SIDCOR, um, or smart circle, they all go through the same company and they all like give you the, it's the same thing. It looks the same. Yeah. So when I went to smart circle and I sat down for this interview and I was, it, it sounded totally different too. They were just like, Oh, well, you're going to be doing sales. Like they were actually upfront about it, which is what I appreciated. They were like, Oh, well, you're going to be doing direct sales. And you're going to be inside of Sam's clubs. And, and I was thinking to myself, I was like, oh my God, I was like, I can make a lot of money doing this. Like if it's AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, look out. Like everybody needs a cell phone like that lot to me in my head. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not going to be scamming people. Like people need new cell phones. They're always looking up great stuff. Like I was like, that sounds legit, right? It doesn't sound bad because all three of my final jobs were sales positions that I'd kind of come into anyways. Um, and so the one was medical sales. Um, which they were going to pay me a whole bunch of money to do, right. um, but there was no growth, right? It was just, you were going to be a medic, like, and everybody knows medical sales is the same. You make a whole bunch of money, but you're always in the same position because until the, until the manager dies, you're not getting promoted, right? Sure. And they're 40. <laughs> and so they're not dying for a while. Um, so you're stuck in that job for how long, right? Um, and then the other one was um, Terminex. Um, and they really wanted me to work for them. Um, and they were commercial sales. And I actually really liked, you know, the things that I had offered me. And I was thinking about taking that, but same kind of thing. Like they had managers and everything else. And I was going to end up being in commercial sales for a while. And I was just thinking, I'm like, I'm not sure if I want to be stuck there. Right. Um, and the whole kind of idea that I got in my head about SIDCOR was like, if I just worked hard enough at it and I got to ownership, I could essentially leverage that system to take my money and start investing in other things so I could open up other businesses so I could pull myself away from the system because I wasn't trying to be in that system forever. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then, so the interview with smart circle happens and I sit down and the first thing I see is that gold binder book. And I almost lost my mind. I was just like, how could I have just gotten away from all of this? And now I'm sitting in an office that is from SIGCOR. And I looked them straight in the face and I said, do you work with SIDCOR? And she goes, no. And I was like, okay, well, then I proceeded to tell her the story. And I said, before we go any further, you need to tell me what's going on right now before I leave. Cause I was ready to get up and walk out out of this interview. Right. Um, 
So she starts to explain to me, no, we're with Smart Circle. And she starts to diss Sid Core and tell me all the bad things about Sid Core and how they struggle to, you know, find different people because Sid Core is rotten and the whole thing and blah, 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 blah. So I'm going, okay. And so we get to the very end and I literally had offers from all three, right? Um, had an offer from Smart Circle Pharmacy Company and um, the commercial sales. So I literally pick whatever I wanted to do. Obviously at this point in my life, I wish I would have picked something different, but you know, we all make mistakes. <laughs> and so um, the reason why I picked Smart Circle was because the way that she talked to me about it and the way that she made it sound was that like, I'm going to get you to ownership and it's going to be really quick because you earned it because I was there at Sid Core for a year and I got completely worked over. Um, and she's like, I don't want to see that happen. Um, you know, and I, I fe she felt genuine and it was with AT&T and it was at a Sam's club. And I was just like, this is like fish in a barrel. Like, this is not hard. I've seen it at a Costco before. Like people want to spend money. Like this is not a, like, this isn't a crazy thing to think about. Um, and then I, it was the same thing. I was just like, well, I'll leverage the system. I'll get to a point where I'll be in ownership. We'll make enough money. And then I'm just going to start moving money around because I saw other owners do it, right? I worked with other owners that literally would have other businesses. And it was almost like they started to pull themselves away from the system to just incorporate themselves to the other businesses they had. And I'm just like, that sounds great to me because I've always wanted to get into other stuff anyways. Like I don't just want one you know, income. I want several. So let me figure out how I can do this. So it made sense. I was like, you know what, we'll do this. And she made me a great offer. The funny thing was, is at the time at COVID, they had those small business loans that people could get. Mm -hmm. And after I left Smart Circle, that's when I found out that she paid me with one of those loans. That was the only way she could afford to keep me. Mm -hmm. Because afterwards, obviously, um, after the following out occurred with OSP and everything else, I kind of backtracked and started to talk to more people and kind of figure out um, and then that was when I was told, well, just so you know, you were paid with a small business loan. And that was the only reason why she could afford you. So if she hadn't had that, if COVID had never happened, I would have never been with smart circle. Um, wow. because I looked at her and I, and I, you know, verbatim said, you're either going to give me $60,000 a year guaranteed before taxes, or I'm not working here. Mm -hmm. And she did not hesitate. She blinked and said, yep, absolutely. Not a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I signed a contract for $60,000 wow. a year. Um, and she paid me, she paid me that money every week, regardless of the sales that I did or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, she paid me that money every week. Um, and I wasn't upset about it, um, uh, because I was making the same amount of money that I would have been making at that commercial job. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't upset about it. And then I was like, perfect. I can move up the ladder. Um, yeah. so she came through on all of her promises. That's why like smart circle wasn't that bad because the thing she actually promised me, she did, you know what I mean? Um, and so that's yeah. how like that first year Sid core kind of ran into smart circle. Um, and that's kind of the, the first part of the story before yeah. we get to the smart circle. That's really interesting about the, that she was willing to take that chance and give you that, um, that upfront. And you think that was based solely on the fact that you spent that year in Sidcor and kind of knew the systems backwards and forwards and were successful. Yeah, they, they really believed, um, you know, um, there are people like obviously, and you've done bits on them from smart circle and whatever or not. Um, the upper level people in smart circle really felt like they've had success. And I met people that were in Sid core that moved to smart circle yeah. that really believed that um, I was going to make a lot of money because there are people from Sid core that come to smart circle and they're quote unquote jaded, I guess, which I wasn't jaded. I was just trying not to be like, I wasn't mad at yeah. Sid core at that time. Um, you know, I just felt like they handled things poorly and I'm not one to, you know, hold grudges. So I was just like, you know what? There's some people in that system that made some mistakes. It's whatever. Um, and I wasn't against the system. I was just like, you better not lie to me. Because obviously when I first started with Sidcore, they lied to me, yeah. right? Um, and the upper levels at Smart Circle believed that I was just going to do very well. And I did. Um, in their organization, um, which it doesn't matter because it's not like they keep track of these things. But um, I broke the record for the fastest promotion from getting hired to being an owner. I did it in less than four months. Um, I started at the end of June and I was incorporated at the start of October um, because, I mean, I earned it a long time ago, but it's yeah. fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but that's why they did it. It's because they believed that I was going to make a lot of money and um, they didn't think it was a, a bad investment, um, I guess. And obviously it was free money, right? At that time, like that small business loan, she didn't have to pay it back. 
right? So what's the hurt in giving a free $60,000 to somebody and then him making you $250,000? Like that's not going to hurt, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. Once you were promoted to ownership that yeah. you called it a disappointment and oh, yeah. <laughs> you are not the first oh, person. A colossal disappointment, let me tell you. Yeah, you are not the first person. You also use these words. Um, it wasn't what I thought it was, which I've heard yeah. verbatim from from many people. Oh yeah. Um, but you were you were trained for this essentially twice. You were trained with this for this with Sidcor, yeah. and you were trained for this guaranteed essentially through Smart Circle. Mm -hmm. And this is what everybody strives for. Everybody that goes in and teaches back the five steps and stays to get promoted to team leader yeah. is striving for ownership. Right. Yet for literally everybody I've talked to um, except for the people I challenge and never get back to me because they think that somehow they're different. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not what it seems to be and it's a colossal failure. So when did you kind of notice that this was happening and why was it as bad as you say it was? Well, you know, when I got promoted um, you know, we had, once I, once I got out of leadership and I was like in the, well, and it was kind of weird too. I just kind of hopped and skipped over assistant management, like me and my promoting owner, since the day I walked in the door, I kind of acted like I was the owner. Cause I was like, I deserve to be here anyway. So I just kind of took everything that she didn't want to do. And I just pretty much did everything for her. Um, because I knew that was what it was going to get me promoted anyways. Plus she was paying me that amount of money, which I'll tell you right now, there are a lot of people who do not make $60,000 a year working no. anywhere. Right. Um, right. and so, um, you know, I just kind of put in the effort. And so I was pretty much an owner from the very beginning and she treated me as such. And I had an office, I had my own office inside of our building. And so, um, it was once I actually became incorporated and they were telling me things that were going to happen, um, that just didn't like, I, I got promoted and I had my team and everybody was making money and I still had to go to the field. And I was just like, what do you mean? Like, I hate it here. Like, I don't want to go sell. Like I just did this for how many, like a year and a half at this point yeah. selling different products. I'm like, I literally just put people in places. So I don't have to do this now. I taught them how to do things the way I do so that they can teach other people. I'm not going back to the field. And that was the problem is like, well, you always have to be in the field because you never know. Like, there was this paranoia that like people are going to quit. And in my head, I just go, well, no, if you treat them correctly, they don't quit. They might not like the job because I'm of the thought process that work is work. It's not supposed to be fun anyways, but if there are parts of your job that you really enjoy, that's why people go to work, right? People don't go to work because they like digging holes, right? People don't go to work because they like pumping toilets. The reason why they go to work is because there's parts of that job that they really enjoy, which is what makes them keep coming back right? Most people, it's the camaraderie, the way you treat them, how you treat them and the way they feel at work, right? So I always made sure that all of my employees felt that way. Anybody that worked for me, I always made sure I made them feel, you know, acclimated to the entire environment that they were as part of the team. If they needed days off, whatever they needed, it was fine. Because at the end of the day, everybody has a life and they don't just work 50 hours a week, <laughs> which is what's expected of you, right? Um, and I did not do that. And that wasn't allowed. Like, it was not okay for you to do that. We were always fighting about it. The fact that you don't go in the field and you've mailed it in is a problem. And I'm just like, it's not though. I own my own company. I'm allowed to do whatever I want because that was the point. Like my thing was, is I'm going to toe the line until I get to ownership. And then I'm just going to do whatever I want. And nobody liked that <laughs> because I'm, I'm a very independent person to begin with. So like people are not going to tell me once I get to a certain point and I know that I have the autonomy, you are not going to tell me what to do. And I was, we were separate at this point. She owned a company and I owned a company and I'm like, you can do whatever you want, but just because I no longer work for you, you don't get to tell me whatever you want. And then I'm just going to go do it now. Like, that's not how this works. And so I kept just doing things that weren't okay with her. We were always getting in fights. Everybody would leave. I'm not going to the field. She's yelling at me going, you should be in the field, this, that, and the other thing. I'm getting phone calls from people at Smart Circle, this, that, and the other thing. And I'm going, I thought I owned my own company. Like, I don't, like, I know people that own their own companies. Somebody does not call them if they are not in the office. Like their wife doesn't go, hey, why aren't you at the office? Why aren't you working? It doesn't matter. If I want to go golf, I'm going to go golf. You want to know why? Because there are people out there making money 
while I'm not. It's okay. That's the point. That's why you own a company. Like that's the American dream, isn't it? <laughs> to work and make money without working. Like that's the point. So we were always fighting about it, right? And so that was a problem. Um, and so we would go through that day after day. Um, and that happened instantaneously. Like after I got promoted, it was always happening. Um, and the biggest thing was, that was the biggest disappointment is I got to pick where I wanted to go, like where I wanted to leave, right? Because they always say, when you get promoted, you get to go to a new market. Um, I didn't get to go anywhere. Like I, I literally told them where I wanted to go. Like, and she literally said, um, you can go wherever um, you want. And I got denied all three things. Like I literally said, I wanted to go here. And they were like, no, that's not why you should go. Like they would give me reasons why I shouldn't go there. And then I'd be like, well, I want to go here. And they'd be like, no, you can't do that. Right. And they'd be like, why not? And then they would explain to me like some rationale, smart circle, like big focus. Like we move chase here. He goes here. He does this. He does that. Cause they know what they're doing because they run the whole thing. So just understand what they're saying. That wasn't the promise you made me. The promise was Chase, you've worked your butt off for a year and a half. You have earned the right to go wherever you want. And from day one, I literally said, X marks the spot. This is where I want to be when you promote me. And instead it was, it's probably better that you stay here with me until we really like get some strength going and then you can go somewhere but it's probably not going to be where you want to go. And I'm just like, that's not what you said. Yeah. Right. So that whole part of it was a complete disappointment because I thought I was going to travel, you know, I was going to get money for us to go travel. Cause you know how they talk about the money they give you when you get to get promoted. Right. They're like, Oh, well, we're going to give you 10, $20,000, whatever it is for you to, you know, go travel wherever you want, start your business. Um, and it was just kind of more broken promises, which upset me because they had come through on everything else, which is really weird, <laughs> right? They'd come through on everything else that they told me up to that point. And then once I started talking about where I wanted to go, there was always a reason why I couldn't go there, right? Um, and it was always my time at Smart Circle. It was, I was always saving the day. So me and my partnering owner, Smart Circle was having problems getting sales in like certain different demographics. And obviously like the you know, that Northeast quadrant, everything's so close together. Right. Yeah. And so we, I was going to different States and just like saving the day, like we would go to different markets and I would get people hired and we would start selling stuff in those stores and things would be going well. And it was almost like, I felt like they wanted to keep me in their pocket to put me wherever they felt like they were struggling because I would save the day. And I'm just like, no, I only did that because I needed to get promoted because I wasn't getting promoted any other way. Don't get me wrong. Like the one thing that I'm going to say that a lot of people kind of have always really said that like, isn't an expectation that they always talk to you about, um, is the money. Um, and I made a lot of money. <laughs> um, smart circle was the first time that I like saw, like people were talking about like, you know, how much money you can make. I made that money at smart circle, like no joke. Right. And I, and I saw my promoting owner, my promoting owner was one of the very few promoting owners um, that made a massive amount of money. And I saw it like legit, like she trusted me enough. I literally saw her bank account and there was a lot of money in it, um, which was very, very surprising considering what I had seen at Sidcor. Um, Cause I still kind of thought like, it's probably the same. Um, but I was very shocked um, to see how much money that she was making. Um, and I was also very stunned to see how much money I was making because the, the program that we were with just, we made, like they paid a lot of money for us to do it. And I was not upset about it. <laughs> um, so I, I was one of the very few um, that made money at it. Um, and so for anybody that has said that, I'm sorry. Um, some of like, and you figured this out, some of the campaigns just suck. Like they're bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but the Sam's club at and program is very lucrative if you do it correctly. Um, but that was probably the only thing that like was actually up to expectation was the money that I made. Yeah. Everything else was just, 
there's always a problem. I was always getting yelled at and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like, why am I getting yelled at? I own my own company. I've worked really hard. And, you know, anybody that's been through this or, you know, worked there for a couple of months, years, whatever, like everybody understands how much of a grind it is. And for you to get to the end and for it to be expected differently, like that's supposed to be the, that's supposed to be the reward. Right. And, and the way that I rationalize it was when I got to professional hockey, like there, that's what I expected to happen. Like that's the end, right. Regardless if it's professionally or if it's the NHL, like there are different types of, you know, professional sports that you can play, whether it's the NFL, the MLB, but like, if you play a sport for money, that's the end. Like, that's the like, Oh my God, like I, I get a paycheck to do this. And there's a certain feeling that comes over you. Um, and that's what I was expecting. And I was just like, this is not, not it at all. Um, and so other than the money, it was the rest of it was just a complete disappointment. Cause mm -hmm. again, just a bunch of real promises about things that they were going to give me and they didn't. Yeah. Every, uh, every story about these companies is a little bit different, but there are always striking similarities. So even though you and your promoting owner made money, it's, it's amazing to hear all of the lies that are told from the beginning. And it, it takes a certain amount of narcissism to be able to exist in a world where you think you can just say anything to people, whether it's true or not, and, 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 real, and think to yourself, in the end, it, it's going to work out my way because everything is my way. Uh, and it's either my way or no other way. I happen to know at least one narcissist. So I'm very familiar with how narcissists think. Yeah. And I think that's, it, it, and I don't know if, and there's no way to know if Sid Core, Smart Circle, Credico create narcissists through the, 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 the impacts of the systems and the meetings and just the, the necessary conformity to be a part of these cults or if it's just the right people that are chosen that have always been that way. I think it's more the former than the latter, but it's almost impossible to know that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would, I would definitely agree with you. Um, also, you know, and I, and I don't mean this as an insult. America is just built differently. Um, there's a lot of things that I've seen in the business world in America that I never saw when I was growing up in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and again, like I said, that's no disrespect. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think there's a reason why America does a lot of the things, you know, quote unquote, great that they do. And then there's some things that they don't do great. Um, but I think there's just this expectation that like, it's a dog eat dog world and that you need to screw everybody you come in contact with in order for you to be successful. Um, and I, I think I'm a defining person and they can say, Sid Core Smarts or OSP, they can say that I'm, you know, whatever they want to say when this video comes out. But I'll tell you right now, one thing I didn't do is I did never compromise my integrity. They told me to do things that I refused to do. And I told them so. I literally was in the field and owners would see things that I would do. And they're like, why do you do that? Because I'm not going to lie to them. People knew that. I, and they're like, well, you don't need to tell them this. And you don't need to tell them that. You know what? I would rather lose one sale because they said no, because they knew the truth. than for me to sign them up for whatever product I just signed them up for. And then I knew full well that I just screwed them not going to do it. I have a conscience. It's not happening. You know, I want to be successful, but I'm not going to sacrifice other people's goodwill and their fortune for me to build on top of. That's just yeah. not what I want to do. And I know that was one thing I always did um, because I told everybody the first thing out of my mouth, anybody who got hired, you will not lie. And if I catch you lying, you're fired. Yeah. And I kid you not, I fired people because they lied and it didn't matter if they were good at it or not. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. You weren't allowed to lie. Because I saw it, just what you said, right? The narcissism from the people above and like how I knew and they thought that I was, I was buying what they were selling me, but I knew that there were lies in there somewhere, that there was something that they weren't telling me. Just like, you know, those awards that everybody gets every week when they, you know, say mm -hmm. how many sales and what, the thing they don't tell you is how many of those are rejected, right? Cool. He made $3,000 this week. I bet you his paycheck's a thousand bucks because two thirds of those people quit. And yeah. you want to know why I know that? Because I'm an owner. <laughs> because I saw the paychecks I sent out and I know that there were people that would destroy it and get so many sales. And that I would see when I would pay them and I'd be like, what happened? Right. Because especially when I was, you know, working for my promoting owner, I would see a lot of that. Like 
there would be compromised integrity. And I would literally tell the people that I train, one of the things that I held most dear to my heart is I had one of the lowest cancellation rates in the country because I told my people, you're going to sell and you're going to make sure they keep it, which means you're only going to sell to people that want it. You are not going to force people to buy things they don't want because at the end of the day, that doesn't create a good system for anybody. You want to know who gets phone calls? Me. <laughs> I don't like phone calls. I don't want to get calls from at and I don't want to get calls from Sam's Club. I don't want to get complaints from these people. So just do me a favor. Do it the right way and we'll be fine. Right? And then, but all these other people, it's almost like the way that it's construed and it's almost like a secret understanding, especially when you get to ownership, don't tell them everything. Like it's right. compartmentalization. And I hated that. I could not stand it. Like as a hockey player at the professional level, I know what everybody's job is. I know all of the information and there are no secrets mm -hmm. because there doesn't need to be. Because when you need to function at the highest level, you, you shouldn't have that stuff. But my owner keeps this for me, keeps that for me, doesn't tell me this. This executive knows this is going on. And I also know what's going on. But then they have a conversation with me and they tell me something completely different. I'm just like, yeah. why do we do that? And it's, it's, it's based in narcissism. And I don't need, sometimes I don't even think they know they're doing it. Like, I think they just, it's gotten to the point that they're in so deep and they're so far in that their integrity gets compromised because of the other people that are around them. Because at yeah. the end of the day, the thing that matters most is making money. Nothing else mm -hmm. matters, right? Mm -hmm. But where I come from, you make money by doing good deeds for other people. Mm -hmm. And I'm a perfect example of it. I made a boatload of money. They, you can literally check the statements that I had for the you know, three, four months that I finished in SIDCOR before I moved to OSP. Like there was no short of money there, mm -hmm. right? Oh, and I literally just told everybody integrity was number one, but you see me beating all these other people that they were literally trying to lie to customers. I would go to the store and see him do it. <laughs> and I'm just like, what are you guys doing? No wonder you're not making money because then that person goes to the other member that is friends that shops at that store and goes, Oh, don't talk to that guy. He lied to me. And I know that he did. Mm. Right. This sure. doesn't win for anybody. Right? right. But at the end of the day, it's because nobody cares because it's about money. Right. Yeah. Because all they talk about, and even when you did it in 2014, the only thing it's the opportunity meaning it's how much money you can make. Oh my God, this, that, and the other yep. thing. I'll tell you right now, unless you're in the right position at the right time at the right place. And I was probably in one of those positions. You'll lucky if you're, you're going to see a third of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I've never really understood the need for companies to have that kind of don't tell everything attitude. I mean, I get it. There are some things that employees don't need to know, but mm -hmm. to have that as an active mindset to not tell people certain things, that veil of secrecy, it creates this suspicion of, well, what are you hiding? What are you doing wrong? And if Smart Circle, Sidcore, Credico, Cobra Group, Abco would stop the, the bullshit lies mm -hmm. and be upfront about every aspect of everything, they would still get people to work yeah, for them. Absolutely. Without a question. What I'm saying, right, is that like people would still work there because yeah. there's no mistake. Sales is good money if you do it correctly. You can do it correctly and not lie. I did it. I know I did it. I go to bed every night and I worked for Direct Energy. They're one of the worst clients ever, right? Mm -hmm. Because once we get to the OSP thing, whoo, yeah. My man, um, direct energy is terrible. And I sold that product for a year and I did it the right way. And I still made money. I didn't go bankrupt. I didn't lose my house. I didn't lose my car, right? Everything was fine because I did it the right way. But the thing is, is it's not about that. It's about as much money as you can possibly make because you need to get promoted. Well, it's kind of like almost in a way without it being a pyramid scheme, it's pretty close to one. Because at the end of the day, the clients pay the executives and the company a boatload of money and they don't have to worry about paying an hourly wage to anybody, right? Because right. who, who picks up that? If you're in a retail store, it's the owner that picks that up. It's not anybody else, right? So the company is like, well, as long as you're selling and the sale goes through, like, you know, like I don't think AT&T is a bad company. I don't think T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, but at the end of the day, it's almost like, you know, out of sight, out of mind, right? Those, sure. those companies don't like, as long as they're generating revenue and their stockholders, like 
you know, it's, it's, I think it's even a larger problem than we've even come across from even talking about like slave circle, and all the different companies is that the biggest companies in the country still continue to allow it to happen. Of course. Right. And part of it, which I would just love to have is like, you know, for companies like AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile to wake up and start looking at these companies and going like, do we really want people that aren't attached to our name selling our products when we think they're doing a good job? Because make no mistake, on the days those people show up, there's a different type of atmosphere in the building than any other day of the week, because we need to make it seem like we're like, the amount of times I heard make sure the pitch is done correctly when those guys are there is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Like the pitch shouldn't have been changed in the first place. And now right. that AT&T is standing in the building, now we got to say something else so that they, they think we're doing something different. Right. And then they come in the store and then they look at it and they hear it. And then it's just like, well, that was different than before. Right. So why are you guys saying different things? And then they're confused. Mm-hmm. Right but they're not going to their executives and saying anything because the message from the executives, which I've been on the phone calls is, Hey, as long as we're making money and they're making sales and it's going through and they're a customer of ours, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. And 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 that's that's about as American, as American as you can get, (laughs) honestly, that's, that's that's centuries, that's That's centuries of American progress. As long as you're (laughs) making money, Screw everybody else. Right. You yep. know, doesn't matter. True story. Okay. So OSP, one source provider, never yep. heard of them. And yep. I'm sure many people also have never heard of them. Right. So can you just kind of quickly give us a little background on what they are? And then we'll get we'll get into how you ended up under their yep. umbrella. No, for sure. Um, one source provider, they, they've been around for about 10 years. Um, and so they they have they have a few different arms. Like I said, they're better at kind of making it look different. Um, so they, they have a direct marketing arm, which is exactly like Sid Core, Smart Circle, all that stuff. Um, and then they have a sports and entertainment arm, which I have nothing bad to say about. They're on point. Um, they, they have a lot of really cool professional relationships with people that are super famous. Like they do boxing promotions and, you know, like, um, you know, the Jake Paul fights that they've done, they've sponsored those. Um, you know, they have their own TV show. Um, they have a bunch of different things. They have their own medical arm um, that does like health, literally like health development. They have like literally research labs. Um, and I've seen all of these things and that stuff's quality. Like it's not bad stuff. Like they do a lot of great work, um, but their main client on their direct marketing side of things is direct energy. <laughs> um, and that's when I even started to find out even more that I knew about direct energy than I could have ever wished I would ever not have found out. Um, and so they've been doing that for about 10 years. So it looks very legitimate because of all these different arms that are hanging on to it. So it looks different, right? It's transforming. And I think that OSP knows that. And they have people from Sidcore working at OSP, right? And obviously they had me, which I was the first one from Smart Circle to jump ship anyways to go to OSP. But a lot of what they do is built from the same system. Um, and over those 10 years, direct marketing was the first thing they did. And then they started to diversify and do all these other things like, which I I said are quality things, but the direct marketing thing is is still the same. They've been around for 10 years. Um, Their head office is in Michigan. Um, And that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, the sports stuff, honestly, like I would have anybody Google them. It's really cool. They have a lot of really amazing guests. I've met a lot of cool sports people um, it's probably the reason why I was attracted, yeah. um, to OSP was because of, you know, like Mike Tyson's floating around Floyd Mayweather's floating around. Um, like those are big deal people, man, like big deal. Um, you know, TI, um, if anybody knows who that is, he's an older rapper for some of the people, but you might know him from Ant-Man. Um, he's floating around, like they have a lot of boxing con, like they got a lot of really cool people hanging around. Um, and they got great content. They do, um, which is really capitalizing off of, you know, social media and everything else. But, um, the direct marketing thing is still the same. Um, that's, that's essentially where it grew from, um, is the direct marketing. You ended up going from smart circle to OSP. Um, what were, what was kind of the situation 
behind that and how did that all lead to uh you know all the the things about that you recognized about how poorly osp was run yeah so um for starters obviously i told you about all the disappointments in smart circle right um and you know hindsight's 2020 um you know i i regret leaving um smart circle i might not be in the business at this point i don't know um but I know like as a person, it was a mistake um, to leave. But I was also, all those disappointments kind of, kind of piled up. And one of the executives from Sidcor um, that I'd stayed in contact with, and he's a great guy. I'm really good friends with him. Um, and we've had a great relationship um, for a long time. And I developed my relationship like from the day that I got to Sidcor. Um, and he just kind of like wrapped his arm around me and um, you know, he was just kind of my mentor for a really long time and I respect him. He's got a lot of different things going on and he's a great guy. Um, and he moved over to OSP. So he had, I hadn't talked to him in probably six or seven months and, um, OSP was growing, um, in their direct marketing sector. And they capitalized off of this executive from Sidcor, um, because Sidcor saw a lot of growth in the last five years that was attributed to him. Um, and so they wanted him at OSP. One of the guys that he worked with as an executive at Sidcor was one of the original employees of OSP. Hmm. So as you can see, connect the dots. Um, one executive recruits another executive that finds me and goes, hey, you're really good in the retail sector um, of direct marketing and we need somebody like that at OSP. Um, you know, and obviously I talked about all the disappointments that I was getting from Smart Circle, right? Um, it was almost, again, it was like a perfect storm. And he hits me up and goes, hey, you know, there's this new company up and coming and I'd never heard of it. Right. And I looked up one source provider and I'm like, they're killing it on Instagram and they're, you know, they got all these YouTube videos and all these famous people. And I was like, Oh, so like, there's a lot of things I can diversify here. You know, I can come over and direct marketing and I can probably swing myself into this sports arm because sports is awesome. And I love it. So it would be a good time. Um, doesn't seem like a bad place to be. And, um, you know, so, um, and as everybody's figured out now, which is fine, I can just kind of tell it was all done in secrecy. Um, OSP um, made me sign a bunch of NDAs um, to make sure that I didn't tell Smart Circle any, anything, which I didn't, um, to make sure that I wouldn't get in trouble from it. Um, you know, I secretly left for a day um, while I was an owner. Um, I said I was sick and I wasn't. I literally flew to Michigan for the day um, to go to OSP. Like this was all like very like covert it was almost like a movie a little bit. Like I was like, you know, faking things and on a plane in Michigan for the day and making it seem like I was not feeling well, but secretly meeting with all these executives at OSP. And they're like, you know, you're the guy we want. And, you know, this, that, and the other thing, um, you know, we really want to get into the retail space. This is happening. That's happening. Um, and yeah, that all sounded great. So I flew back that day. Um, and I really liked everything that I saw. And I think it was just more of like, I felt like I was in a culture that was like mine because the people I met with were sports people and they had done things in sports and, you know, done things professionally. And I just kind of felt like we agreed on a lot of, um, for lack of it's called intangibles, like things that you should have as a person that you can't really develop, but like you just have. Um, and I, it, it just seemed like the type of culture I wanted to be a part of. And so, um, you know, I was having all these, you know, issues at Smart Circle getting yelled at every day. And I was like, man, I'm a, I own my own company and I am tired of being yelled at. And then at top of that, I literally had a meeting with them the week before where they told me they couldn't, that they weren't going to let me go where I wanted to go. And I was like, you know what, maybe it's time to move. Um, and so it seemed like the right idea. So OSP was like, okay, well, you need to bring your company. So I had to covertly have secret meetings, right? Like, this is stupid. Like, I shouldn't have to do this but I had to hide it from smart circle because they would destroy me if they ever found out. Right. So I had to have secret meetings with all of my employees to figure out which ones were in it and which ones weren't. Um, and I finally got down to my brass tacks of, of who I wanted. And we had these secret meetings with OSP trying to figure out like, when are you going to leave? When are we going to execute this, that, and the other thing? Um, you know, and I remember the day we were going to execute, um, you know, there was this uneasiness inside of me and I don't get like nervous very often. And I don't like get bothered by many things, but having to go into my promoting owner's office and tell her that I was leaving and not only tell her that I was leaving, but lie because 
I'm under contract with Smart Circle still. And now I'm moving to another company and this is all legal stuff, right? So if they find out that this is that, you know, Smart Circle can come at me for multiple different things because I'm an owner. If you're an employee, none of those, none of those things matter. But when you're an owner, like there's a lot of things like you got to jump hoops around and everything else. And yeah. my biggest thing was like that NDA for a smart circle stretches a certain amount of distance. And I literally had to go through my contract and figure out how many miles it was. So I knew that if I left, I, I cleared enough distance that they wouldn't, they couldn't come after me legally because I knew they would. Right. Um, because my promoting owner is, is that way. Um, and so I was like, I can't have that happening. And I knew she was going to do whatever it took for me to stay when I went in there. And she, it was so sad. Like I walked in there and she pretty much, first of all, she invalidated all my feelings. So like I was telling her how I was feeling about like all of this stuff. Um, and then she just invalidated everything I said, like, you know, you're not working hard enough. It's your fault. You know, you should be doing this. No wonder you're feeling like that. Like, you know, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. I know you're not doing this. You should be doing that. Um, you know, and then I, I, I went into the whole, you're not moving me thing. And, you know, I'm upset about that, blah, 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 blah. And I said, look, I, I'm leaving. And it was so funny. She went from invalidating and like treating me like that. And she did a 180 and she started crying. I don't know why the people, <laughs> they start crying, <laughs> but she started crying. And she tried to do whatever she could to get me to stay. She said, you know, we'll, we'll call the executives. And if you're not happy with the amount of money you're getting paid, we'll pay you more money and this, that, and the other thing. And it was like, you're garbage chase. But as soon as I said I was leaving, it was like, you're the unsung hero. Don't leave. We need you. We'll pay you as much money as you want. Whatever you want, I'll make you happy. It's like, you literally just spent 30 minutes of this conversation invalidating everything that I felt and telling me how it's my fault. And now you're going to look at me and go, no, no, you're a superstar. I don't want you to leave. What can we do to get you to stay? Mm -hmm. Right. That conversation takes about an hour and, you know, she's crying for most of the end of it. Um, and I leave. Right. And at this point it's, I'm done. It's not that I'm leaving to go to OSP. It's I'm done. I don't know what's going to happen with the other employees, which is a complete lie, which I also don't feel good about. Right. Because I, I would have loved to walk in there and just be honest. Yeah. Right. And I literally, obviously I'm married now. Like I would have loved to tell my wife, Hey, I'm just going to go in there. And I'm just going to tell her everything and it'll be totally fine. I literally said to my wife, I feel really bad about this. Cause I do not want to lie to her. I want to walk in there and just be straight up. But I know that the firestorm that it's going to create. And that's what these companies do. Cause I've heard it 6,000 times when people transfer companies and the legal actions, and they try to do this to you and that to you. And they just try to destroy your entire life for no reason, because it's not okay for you to, you know, chase the opportunity, right? Because they preach the opportunity every day. But as soon as you like may, might find something that might be more of an opportunity for them, they're like, we're going to destroy everything about you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so all of that is a lie. I feel really bad. I leave. Right. And we're executing the next week to leave. Right. So that all happens. Everybody's like calling me on the phone, all these smarts, critical executives, all that. I'm just like, I'm done. Right. And I'm lying to all these people. I'm just like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. It's not fun. I don't enjoy it. It's been a disappointment. You know, they're like, well, we gave you everything you wanted, but it's like, well, no, you didn't, but it's fine. You can think that. <laughs> um, and so they're calling me throughout the week and I'm getting all these phone calls. And then obviously um, we're planning on leaving the next week. Right. So this is where all of this stuff right from the beginning OSP is just like, there's these things that were supposed to happen that did number one is that they were supposed to give me $10,000 to move. They gave me $5,000. And then the next $5,000 was only going to get given to me once I hit certain performance standards, which wasn't what I was told. Yeah. What I was told and what was in writing was $10,000 for moving expenses. Right. So I only get five. I kid you not. I had to, I had to spend probably $15,000 on top of the money they gave me to get these people apartments, to get them furniture, to move them across the country, to make sure that they had everything they needed to have. Because I don't think people understand this, but when you move a company, it's not cheap. That's why I asked them for money. 
Because mm-hmm. I said, I'm not moving if you don't pay me for it. So the first thing is, is they give me five instead of 10, right? Um, and then the second thing is, is I go, well, you need to pay these people wages, right? Because in the retail system, I'm going to take a hit because for the first two weeks, right? There's no commission coming in. So you guys need to cover that. Oh yeah, no, no, that's no problem. We'll pay their wage for, for the first two weeks. Okay. Well, their wage is $800 a week. So you guys need to pay them that, right? Okay. Yeah, no, 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 that's fine. So we leave and we get there, right? Um, we leave in the middle of the week and we're supposed to start on a Thursday. I get a call on Wednesday that says, Hey Chase, we're actually only going to pay them $300 uh, for the weeks. And then the rest is performance. And I went, that's not what was agreed upon. It's $800 a week. So now all of this money I had saved, right? Thank God I'm not stupid. And I didn't spend the money that I had at Smart Circle, right? Um, I had to pay them money when I wasn't making any money either because we just moved. Now I'm paying them wages and paying them for the next two weeks and there is no money coming, right? Um, And then so there's the second one. And just so we're clear, I haven't even started selling for these people yet. Two broken promises. And I haven't even started selling for these people yet. Um, And then I was there for, we were in a hotel for the first week um, because we needed to figure out like where we were going to live and like, you know, where the central location was going to be and what was going to make sense. Right. And so um, we stayed there for a week, um, you know, told my hotel expenses were going to get covered. They were never covered. You know, I spent almost a thousand dollars for a week for the, what was there, eight of us. (laughs) Um, And, and I was forking money out left and right. Like the tough part is, is when they move, right? Like number one is they weren't expecting to leave either, right? I'm the owner. So I had the money saved up. So I was paying, like, you know, we were going for dinner and I was making sure that I was like giving them like five or $10 for an allowance so that they could eat. Like, cause I knew they didn't have a lot of money. Right. And so I'm doing what a CEO is supposed to do. Like a real CEO helps his employees. And so I'm doing everything I can to make sure that these people, they're going to be able to go to work. They're going to be able to eat. Everything is going to be totally fine. So week one passes and then we finally, you know, get a place to live, everything else, everything is fine there. Um, And they told me they would help me with my living expenses for the first month. Also didn't happen. They said they were going to give me half of the living expenses that we needed to cover and they didn't, right? Um, It was all based on performance. So they kept like saying that, oh no, no, we were going to do that. But now it's like, well, we spoke about it and now it's living expenses. like, cool. So essentially what you did is you trapped me and now I have nowhere else to go. And so now you're just going to force me to work anyways. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, that is what it is. And the sad part is, is these are the, like, we're not even, we haven't even started selling yet. And these six people are depending on me for their livelihood. And I've made them pick up everything and go to a different state. Sure. And in search of this other opportunity that we could make a whole bunch of money at and start something really big because OSB didn't even have a retail program. Like we were the first one, right? Um, this is all brand new. Um, and I can't even tell my employees that from day one, we're already getting screwed. Right. Um, and so, and so obviously I'm dealing with all of this pressure, right. And then I'm trying to help these guys get out to the field and make money and, you know, get to these stores. And there's just so much stuff that goes on with that. And it was really tough. So after that, after the first month, the executive that recruited me completely left. So the protection that I had in terms of like the things I was doing and how I was doing them, they were no longer there. And then they hired this liaison guy um, and his name is Dimitri Potashnik. And I hope somebody can spell that right. And if you want to put in the uh, the comments, this guy is a walking Sid Core billboard and he's a scumbag. Um, He's about three feet tall and he has small man syndrome. And he is the reason why I no longer work at OSP um, because he had me forced up. Um, And so he gets hired about a month in to run the retail program because he was super successful at Sidcor, right? Which means that like he made a bunch of money, he screwed a bunch of people over um, and he's perfect. Like he's he's the person, when you think about Sidcor, he's that guy, right? Um, And he started working with me and immediately me and him didn't see eye to eye. Like, cause I, I was running my company the way I did in smart circle. And the agreement was when I came to OSP that I was going to do what worked and what worked was what we did at smart circle because the numbers proved it. I literally showed them what I had done since I had started 
at Smart Circle, not just ownership, but just the whole gamut, right? And they were very impressed. They're like, okay, yeah, well, that's fine. You, you take what you got. You don't have to do the OSP model and you're going to do what you do and just make sure like, you know, you incorporate some OSP stuff in there because like we need you to. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, it's not that big of a deal as long as I don't change the big stuff. He comes in and all of a sudden it's like, this isn't working. That's not working. You're doing this wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. I know I've been in the business for nine years and that's wrong. And this is wrong. And this is wrong. Right. And we always had conversations of there's 9,000 ways to skin a cat, but there isn't. There's Dimitri's way and that's the only way, right? Um, and so as time goes on, I am continuously forced to keep changing things and changing things and changing things, right? And my employees are like so upset because again, these are things that were promised to them. They were told by OSP when we had our conversation with everybody was that, you guys don't have to change that much. You're only moving. All of the stuff is going to be the same, right? You're still going to work. You're still going to get paid and everything's going to be fine. Um, and then everything was just the longer I was there, it was, this isn't working right. You're doing this poorly. This isn't going, this isn't going. Um, and they were always making, it was just like, well, your system doesn't work. So now we have to change it, right? And this is the only thing that my employees ever knew. Right. So not only are they in a new place, but now you're just starting to change things continuously because they don't work after a month. Like that's normally not a thing. Like people need to get acclimated. They need to get settled. They're dealing with a lot of things. Like you can't just expect to show up and like just blow the doors off of anything. Like number one, the program's brand new, right? There's a feeling out process that has to occur as well. Right. You can't just go in there and sell a thousand dollars a week and everybody be happy. Right. Um, so now they're making me do all these OSP things that are exactly like SIDCOR, like just exactly like SIDCOR. Um, and my smart circle people are going like, I don't want to do this. Right. So now I'm sitting, having meetings with my company going, look guys, like, and I, and this is what I got in trouble for. I was telling my employees what was going on other than like the big stuff, like you said, like money, like having those broken promises, whatever I was paying my own money to cover that stuff. So they didn't even know. Right. But in terms of like the, the operational things I was changing, right? I'm just like, look, guys, you know, OSP, you know, they're the ones that kind of work with us and everything else. Like, we got to make this change. We got to make this change because I'm, you know, I was just essentially appeasing them, essentially. Um, and it was more or less like, well, Chase, if, if you don't do it, we're just going to cancel your contract. And I'm just like, well, I just got here and we all signed a year lease to these apartments and that's not cool, right? So obviously as a business owner, I'm just trying to figure out whatever I can do. And it wasn't even about me. Like, I'm just worried about the six employees that I have and what they're going to do. Right. And so I'm just trying to make sure it's just operational and they're taken care of. Right. So then the first thing is Dimitri shows up, um, in the first three weeks, he gets into a racially charged conversation with one of my employees outside of work. Um, and I lose my recruiter and I lose her boyfriend. Right. And then on top of that, I lose another person because she's also half black. Um, and because I did nothing about the situation, which um, is what they said I did, <laughs> um, I just lost three of my employees. And then he comes back to me and goes, Chase, be glad they quit because clearly they weren't the right people. What are you talking about? You literally just were racist towards my employees. And on top of that, you were prejudicial to other groups of people. And it's they're, they're the problem. I'm pretty sure you're the problem. So I told OSP what he had done. And more or less, they swept it under the rug. Mm -hmm. They were just like, well, Dimitri's the way Dimitri is. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's, excuse, pardon me, he's just a piece of shit. Like, that's what he is. Right. So then, of course, the people that are working for, we're all, we're living down the hall from each other. Okay. We live in the same apartment complex, but we don't live together. So those horror stories of like when people talk about they move and they all live together, that was not happening. I was not having it, right? And so three of us lived in one apartment and then the other three lived in the other apartment, right? Um, and of course, that situation is three people in one apartment. So they're all living and getting different jobs and whatever else, but we're all like still friends and like, they're, they're not just my employees. Like I had personal relationships with these people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and now all they're telling me is like, you got, you got to keep these guys away from them. And I'm like, why? Like they're friends. What are you talking about? 
right? And they're like, well, they're going to, you know, upset their mindset and they're going to get them nagged out and they're going to convince them to quit and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there going, honestly, if it was me, I'd quit too. Like if this wasn't my livelihood and you just put me in $30,000 worth of debt that I got to figure out how to climb out of because of a bunch of promises you made to me and you're still blaming it all on me that it's my fault because they're not working hard enough and I'm not putting them in the right situations and all these other things. Um, and it's still all my fault. Well, maybe they should quit then. And I'm just like, well, that's such a terrible mindset to have. Like, I'm not going to tell them they can't have friends. Like they're the only people we know. Like, what do you mean? We moved like to a whole different state and they're the only people we know. And I'm continuously being told, protect them, protect them, protect them, protect them, protect them. And I'm just like, from what? It's your fault this happened. Like your employee is the reason why this has all occurred, right? Mm -hmm. And they're still blaming it on my people going, well, they have poor mindsets and they're not open-minded enough to know that like, people have different um, trains of thought. And I'm like, well, sure. But this is at the time it's 2021. Like we know the world we live in, like there are correct ways to say things and there are correct things to say. And then there's a time and a place. And none of that was the time and the place for it. Right. Yeah. Um, and they just acted like, Oh, it's just Dimitri. That's just how he is. And swept it right under the rug. And so now I've got not only my ex employees, up in arms about that, which I was, I wasn't okay with it either. Um, cause I wanted him fired. I was like, this guy just got here and he's a piece of garbage already. Like I don't ever want to be around this guy again. Um, but apparently I was the only one that felt that way because <laughs> everyone else really liked him. Um, and we always had problems. Like every single time I would see him, um, there was always an issue because chase wasn't listening. I wasn't towing the line. I was doing what I did at smart circle because I do what works. I don't do what you tell me to do. Right. And just because you have the system and you tell me, just so we're clear, there's more than one way to run the system. And I don't have to lie to people to get them to do these things. And I'm continuously being told by Dimitri, well, don't tell them this, don't tell them that, do this, go here instead. And essentially just like set up these like egregious types of situations. And I'm just like, what? you really are a dirtbag. Like, why would you tell me to do something like that? Right. Um, and he's like, well, that's how we did it at Sidcor. And I'm like, that's nice. If you guys all went and jumped off a building, I wouldn't go jump off it too. <laughs> like that doesn't seem like a good idea, right? Um, and then of course, the next thing that starts happening is I hired these new people and we got them trained and they're in leadership and they're doing well. And then they start struggling, right? Um, and which happens everywhere because sales are cyclical, right? Sales are cyclical. And He's like, okay, well, you got to go in there and you got to tell them that now you're just going to make them go down at minimum wage because they're not selling enough um, and they'll work harder. All that ha happened was they quit. <laughs> and I'm just like, are you kidding me? And I'm at this point, like I, I'm hemorrhaging money. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've been hemorrhaging money since the day I got there and it never stopped from the day I got there to the day that I left. I hammer, I was in so much debt. Um, air high five, me and my wife just paid off that debt. So we're in the clear. <laughs> awesome. So, um, but they, I was hemorrhaging money the entire time. Um, and I was just trying to like develop a, develop a relationship with my employees that they would go to work and they would be happy with what they were getting paid. And I knew that they were going to sell if they were put in the right situations. And I was always told to put pressure on them all the time. And I'm just like, but the problem is, is when you put pressure on people, most people don't excel when you put pressure on them. Mm -hmm. That's a very specific group of people. It isn't a lot of people. <laughs> Most people do not do well in those situations. They need time to develop and learn their skills and do these things. And Dimitri's continuously telling me, put pressure on them, put pressure on them. They're going to do well if you put pressure on them. And all they're doing is like crumbling, essentially, doing terrible at work, going to the store, not doing anything, right? Not just standing around because they're like, I hate this. Like, Chase was one person and now all of a sudden he's putting pressure on me and I don't know what to do. And I feel terrible about it. Cause I'm like, I don't know what else to do. Right. Um, and I got to a point where I was like, well, you know what, maybe what Dimitri is, cause it, it got, I kept getting told to tell so many, like to change so many things that I thought, well, maybe, okay. Like they see a lot of Dimitri. So maybe he might know what he's doing. So then I started to try it and then things just got worse. They didn't get better. He was like, Chase, trust me, if you just do what I tell you every day. So I did it for a month and my business completely fell apart. People, I couldn't keep people to save my life. 
Nobody wanted to work there. Started to get bad reviews of like, oh, you need to rebrand. I was like, no, I don't. I'm not rebranding. That's not a thing. I'm not going to do that. You guys might do that, but I'm not going to. My company is my company and I'm not changing the name because unlike some people that get a company, like the name of my company is important to me because it stems from my dad. Like it was like, I developed my logo and everything I did because of my dad. I was like, that's important to me. I'm not rebranding. And all they're talking about is, well, you should do a rebrand because things aren't going well. And, you know, maybe we can get you to go here or maybe you can get to go there. And I'm just like, so you guys put me in this terrible situation. You didn't pay me the money you told me you were going to pay me. And now you're looking at me going, well, maybe we should just move you out of this situation. And I'm just like, I just got here. Like it's like three months, right? All of the people that work for me that have now quit are in apartments that they have leases till for an entire year. Like you have completely screwed everybody, right? And I like, I'm, at, I'm up to here in debt at this point, right? Like I wasn't making any money either, right? Um, and so, because obviously like logically, right? I'm hiring people and then they're not making money and I still have to pay them, <laughs> right? And so I'm not making as much money as um, to clear anything. So I'm just continuously more debt, more debt, more debt. And they're standing in the corner giggling at me going, well, you're clearly not doing the right things. Like, it's just because you won't listen. And I'm just like, sure. So then I started listening and then it just went from bad to worse. Um, and so that was like three months of continuality. And Dimitri would just continuously cause problems. Nobody liked Dimitri. So I think that's a message to Dimitri Potashik. Maybe you shouldn't just be a scumbag and maybe figure it out. Um, I don't know if he still works at OSP or not. I could really care less. I never want to see that guy in my life again. We get towards the end um, and they're like, you should go on a retrain. So I've never been said to the, I've never been said this to my, to me in my entire career. And I'm like a retrain. No, I own a company. I'm not taking a step back. I am. I'm not doing that. And I agreed. And I said, look, I will go work with another owner but you will not take my company. I will be getting paid my regular commission that I get paid as an owner. And I am not an employee of that company. Okay. Yep. That's cool. So you're going to go over here and you're going to work with this other owner. Um, and you'll leave the employees you have here. Um, because there was another, again, there was another owner in our office. <laughs> um, so we were working together. Um, and I left the three employees that I had there with them. Um, and said, and they were just like, make sure you don't tell your employees that you're doing this. And I was like, well, we live together. So that's a terrible idea. Right. And so I said, look, they're looking at thinking about doing retail up in this area. And that wasn't really a lie. They were thinking about it, but that's not why I was going up there. Um, and I'm going to go work with this owner. And the owner was pretty successful and, um, he, he was doing really well, but he was doing, um, door to door at and So, he was doing really good. Um, and so like go up and work with him. As soon as I got there, they stripped me of my ownership. Like I literally got demoted and the, I was working for him because he literally sat there and looked at me. He goes, yeah, I had a meeting with the higher ups at OSP. Um, so you're no longer an owner. Um, I'm paying you as an employee. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Like I just moved up here and you told me, you know, and it wasn't like a move move. Like I just brought my clothes up there and I was like, okay, I'm going to work here for a bit. Right. Like not very long. And he goes, it's, you, you have to get re-promoted. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm an owner. Like I literally get paychecks to my account. And he goes, oh no, no, no. OSP is not going to put them in your account anymore. They've disabled all of that. You don't get to, and I'm like, so I have a company and you guys just froze the account you pay me through. So I'm not going to get any more money. He goes, yeah, that's pretty much it. He goes, you're an employee of mine now. So you, you need to, I literally had to do employee paperwork. And at this point, like I'm hemorrhaging money, like I need to make money. So what am I going to do? Right. They've again, backed me into a corner and I'm just like, well, I have no money. So like, what am I going to do? Right. Well, I guess I'm going to work. Right. So I'm there for like six weeks or whatever it is. Um, and I'm just battling, 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 battling. And then we had our um, uh, classic national conference, right. Cause they all have them. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and at the time, my wife, had been my recruiter this entire time at OSP. Um, and she was crushing it, um, doing so well. Um, lots of the girls took a lot of her ideas. She was great. Um, and I had said, well, like I'm still an owner, right? So I get to go to the national conference as an owner, right? And they're like, yep, cool. So you get to bring your recruiter to the national conference. So I brought my wife because she's my recruiter, right? 
Um, which of course I fell into that trap too. How dare I, everybody that's married is in the business. And that wasn't cool. <laughs> I always <laughs> promised myself that would never happen, <laughs> but it did. Um, and so we go to the national conference. I am not listed as an owner and they barred my wife from all of the ownership activities because I was no longer an owner. They did not say that to me until I got to that conference. So I flew my wife across the country. Okay. So she was still in Maryland and we were in Chicago. She took a flight to Chicago to be with me at this national conference, right? Keep in mind, we haven't seen each other like at all in six months. Like I think I saw her twice. Um, and we're super excited to have this weekend because it's going to be a lot of fun. And this national conference was like different than the Sid Core and Smart Circle ones, which I was kind of excited about because they had some sports people there and it wasn't set up the same way. Um, it wasn't like, you know, the Sid Core national conferences are just, it's all Sid Core, like for oh, sure. It is talking all the time. Smart Circle, same thing. Whereas OSP, they have like famous people <laughs> like Mike Tyson was there. Um, they were talking about Floyd Mayweather showing up. Like there's just, there was a few famous people that I met when we were at that conference. Um, and she was looking forward to it. And we literally, the first thing we did, they were just like, yeah, your wife's not involved. Like, what are you talking about? I'm an owner and she's my recruiter. They're like, no, 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 no. You're not listed here as an owner. You're listed here as an assistant manager. And I went, excuse me. And so I went directly to the executive and I went, what the hell are you doing? we agreed that this wasn't happening. He goes, yeah, but you agreed to go on a retrain. I said, no, I didn't. I said, I agreed as an owner to go up and work with another owner to make you guys happy. And I said, you weren't going to demote me. And he goes, well, it doesn't really matter what we say. I said, it's what we do. And I was like, oh, cool. So now you're just below your word is what you're telling me. You just say things and then you just choose to do otherwise. Um, and he goes, well, you haven't done the work anyway, so it doesn't matter. He goes, you, you don't deserve to be an owner, clearly. And I was just like, good conversation. So again, it's the self-deprecation and the, you know, kicks in and I'm like, yeah, it's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. And he's downgrading me for five minutes, telling me all the things that I've done wrong. And that, you know, everybody, especially, and the one thing that's the same in every single executive order is they use the one thing against you that they know that'll bother you. And it was always professional hockey for me. Everybody I met always, they didn't introduce me as an owner. They always said, yeah, he plays professional hockey. That was who they introduced me as because that's my identity. That's who yeah. I always identified myself as, as a human for the longest time. It's literally ingrained in my system. So they would always just, well, you play professional hockey. Why can't you do this? And then of course the self-deprecation would kick in and I'd just be like, you're right. You're right. Yep. I played pro hockey. I did it at the highest level, like figure it out. Right. Um, and so like my wife was so distraught. She literally the next day, like we were supposed to have this dinner and stuff the next day. My wife flew home the next day because I was just like, well, you shouldn't be here. You're slapped in the face. And I clearly should just not even be here because I'm not an owner anyways. Um, so we go through the national conference and, um, you know, they act like it wasn't a big deal that that happened. And I kind of had just done it to myself. Um, and then, um, I ended up going back to the place where I was on this retrain at. Um, and financially I was just, I was tapped out. Like it was just, I couldn't, I had literally zero money. Right. And I mean, my wife had, you know, um, I'm, I'm a very proud person. So my wife didn't really give me a lot of money. Like we have separate financial differences. Like she does her stuff and I do my stuff and then we do stuff together. Yeah. And I refuse to take money from my wife, which is probably dumb because we're in a marriage, but I refuse to take money from him. I was like, and she's like, maybe you should just come home. And I was just like, and again, like the athlete in me is no quit. I'm not giving up. Like I'm going to prove to everybody that this, I'm going to show everyone that I am the best. And, you know, it's sad to say, but it was the first time I kind of just, I just packed it in. I was just like, it's been three years and all I've done is, you know, I thought I got to the top of the mountain and then I was disappointed. And then all OSP did from the very beginning, it was after my executive left, OSP, like as soon as he recruited me and he was pretty much gone, like I had no protection after that. Um, and it just went from bad to worse and it was never good there. Um, you know, and I'm not going to say the company as a whole is bad. I know that I've met people on in the other arms and they love OSP and I bet it's great, but the direct marketing side of things, like 
nobody that I met as an owner there, they're not there anymore because it's, it's almost impossible unless you're with direct energy, which this is probably why they stay afloat is because their direct energy program at OSP is the best in the country. So think about like credit co smart circle, all those companies. So OSP has the highest grossing direct energy market in the entire country out of all of the companies. So OSP rakes in so much money from that um, and all of their other programs fail. Um, I don't even know if they have any other programs at this point. I just know that everybody that I knew that was there as an owner is now gone um, or rebranded um, because obviously rebranding is, you know, such a smart tool to use. You know, we were just funny. We were just looking up the, the other owner that I worked with at OSP and they rebranded. You know, it's really sad. Their web page is the exact same. They just changed the logo. It even says at the bottom of the page, it still says their old company name. <laughs> like, how bad is that? Right. Yeah. Um, and so that part of OSP, just like, you know, if you're in the sports marketing side of things and they do that, they do a bang up job. And honestly, I probably would have loved to work there, but the direct marketing side of things, like they do not have the right people in place. And it was a complete joke. The whole whole time from Sidcore to smart circle to osp you really didn't question the system like you there were there were things that you didn't conform to and obviously in, to be successful in these companies you have to conform and you did to a degree but you also held out a lot more than nearly every person that i end up talking to whether they do an interview or not right. so I, I i honestly don't even know what the question is but like looking back do you did you were there any moments where you kind of questioned the validity of any of that so many. or was it just when you when you got out and had time to think so th there were there were always like they were just like faint like it would happen and then it would go away right like just little things. And I'd just be like, Oh, and I, I just logic things out. And I just go, yeah, this happened because of this, because of that. And because I was an owner, like for so long, like I just, I knew the inner workings and I knew why you would make the moves that you would make. And I would just logic them out that way. Like, ah, well, you know, it's probably why they did that or they did this and move on. And then something else would happen. Right. And even when with the money and not getting paid and all this other stuff, like I would always logic it out and there would be some reason as to why it didn't happen so that I could trick myself into keep going because my brain only knows one speed and it's 110. Like I do everything with all of my being. Um, and that's how I always get the most out of myself. And so when something bad would happen, I would just think about it, see that it happened. And then I would just move on. And there was never a day, like literally never a day until that last part of OSP, when my wife said, maybe you should leave, um, that I thought about leaving because I never did. Even at Sigcor, like I told you that day that I quit, that, that was not in the cards. Right. I was not quitting like that. That was not happening. And then at smart circle, I didn't think about leaving until that executive from Sidcor called me up and was like, well, we got a better opportunity for you. And I'm just like, well, I mean, they bred me to chase the opportunity. So, well, yeah. here it is, right? So I'm just gonna take that one. Um, and the same thing at OSP, all these bad things are happening and I'm just logicing them out and going like, you know, and I don't, it's a product of the system for sure. Like it's, as you become an owner and they kind of, they teach you it's a necessary evil almost right? Like it's once you get to ownership, there are things that happen and they, they don't even sugarcoat it. Like they'll tell you the truth for the most part, but it's that like, it's an explanation is like, it's just a necessary evil. It has to happen, but it's okay. Cause a plus B will equal C. So it like, just don't stress it too much. Right. Yeah. Um, and that was always the thing. It was just like, it's almost like a necessary evil, but you'll get there. It's a necessary evil, but you'll get there. So I just kept telling myself, well, this is America. <laughs> There's the necessary evils that are going to happen. It's okay. Just battle. Like you, it always, for me, I, 
you know, maybe my brain's broken because I'm an, like a high performance athlete, but we all think the same. It's you work hard, you'll come out of it. You work hard, you'll come out of it. Right. And so I just kept working and working and working and working and working and working and working. And, and, you know, it, it worked until I got to OSP and then it didn't matter how hard I worked. It was Dimitri and people inside the company had made up their mind that I didn't need to be around anymore. And they knew, they knew I wasn't going to quit. That was the problem is how do we get rid of Trace without like getting like for, they wanted to force me to leave, but they couldn't get me to leave because of contractual obligations and whatnot. Um, getting to do it on his own volition because they knew I wasn't going to give up because I told everybody I'm not quitting. Like, I don't, I don't quit things. That's not what I do. Right. Um, and so it was, it was always just necessary evils. And like I said, until I saw that video for Dan from Dan, I didn't really, none of it kind of linked together. And then, cause I'd never met anybody that had gone through what I'd gone through. Like everybody had just given up, mm -hmm. right? Like they just quit. And there are people like that. There are, there are people that are just like, this is dumb. I'm done. Right. But right. there are clearly a lot of people like Dan and me that just like, <laughs> you work yourself to death every single day of the week, hoping that it's going to change. Um, and it doesn't, and it's, it's our fault too. Like the system does a great job of like teaching you, like, this is how it's supposed to be. And then it's almost like, it's like a weird little magic trick on your own brain where it just like, you trick yourself into thinking that it's always your fault yeah. and you just keep going. And that's, it was always just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And that was always the voice in my head. Um, and they do a great job of that. And with specific people, and they always say the commonality between SIPCOR OSP and smart circle is, and I've heard it from all three of them. The most successful people in our business are athletes. You want to know why? It's because our brains are built differently because when all signs say quit, we don't, which is a good thing sometimes. Yeah. Bad most of the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because sports doesn't work the way real life does, right? And after I got out of hockey, that was a wake up call for me because playing a sport is like very black and white. Like when you play a sport, like yeah. if you outwork somebody else, you're not going to lose. But in the game of life, like it is very different, right? But athletes, especially if you do it at a high level, you don't, it's almost like you think, because everybody always tells you, well, hard work is like a positive thing to have. So you think that working hard is going to get you out of every situation. And it doesn't, it actually like allows you almost to be manipulated even more. Um, because that's how I felt. Like after I left and I saw that video from Dan and I started watching all your other stuff, I just felt like they did it worse to me because I was like, my brain worked differently. And I was so... I wouldn't say I was easily manipulated because like I said, I went against a lot of the stuff they did. Right. Right. But the core principles, that stuff was the things that I just like straight lined on. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yep, they're right. Go. Right. Um, but there was never any doubt. Like there were small moments all the time, but there was never a thought in my mind that like, I should not do this ever. So looking back on this, uh, you know, obviously anybody who fails out of this, regardless of how successful you were in it, you were an owner, yep. uh, you made money. Oh yeah. Um, I've talked to multiple owners who were successful top owners oh, yeah. who were on the lists, who were on the calls every week, but now that they're coming out and, and speaking out against these devil corp companies, now they're the enemy, oh, yeah. they're failures. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. So looking back on this, is this, does this work? for anybody like we know the the evils that are smart circle sidcore and now osp and all these these other companies we know they're evil companies yep it, does it work for anybody it would this be a positive for anybody if you're an executive yeah <laughs> um if you're just trying to find a job and you're, you need to make ends meet. Probably not like, unless you are in the right financial situation. And what I mean by that is like, you're not desperate for money. Yeah. Um, you know, which let's be clear, the American system in general is very good at debilitating most people. Um, and it, it, people are always in desperation for work. Mm -hmm. Um, 
it's not the right choice um, because you spend so much time at work and you have no life and sometimes it doesn't pay off, right? Like I would, you know, I, I would, some weeks I would destroy it and I'd make like two grand a week and I would get a check that would be two grand a week. And then I would go to work the next week and I would work just as well. I wouldn't change any of the things that I did because of like when things happen, you don't change them. So, okay. And then I would make $500, especially when you're just starting, you don't even get good at it yet. Like you, right. for, like if you don't, if you can't stick for at least three months, you're not going to make money. You're just going to be screwed. Right. And yeah. that was one of the things that I did was if I sat with people and I could tell they were desperate, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell them that, but I wouldn't hire them. Because I'd just be like, this isn't a good fit for you. Like you're going to come in here and you're going to have to struggle and you're not going to make a lot of money. And if you're looking to pay your bills, you should probably go work at McDonald's because at the end of the day, McDonald's is going to give you a more re reliable paycheck. Right. Um, and I, you know, I like to say that I, I cared about people that way. Like I would only hire people that I knew that long term would be good at it. I would never hire people short term. And there were a lot of people that hated that. They're like, that's so dumb. Like you need to just have as many people as possible. I'm like, I'm about quality. I'm not about quantity. I could care less if somebody doesn't sell for three weeks, but after they figure it out and they're great, I would rather have that person because at the end of the day, that's longevity and that's what you want, right? Because I was running my business the way, like for lack of a better term, like a normal business, I guess, yeah. runs, right? Like you want quantity, you want quality, not quantity, right? And so I was always looking for people that, weren't really like struggling and they were like looking for the long-term benefits of like, you know, how can I put my money to work and you know, what is this going to teach you? And that was more of what I was focused on. Um, but anybody that's like just regular, like just trying to make ends meet bad idea, not good for anybody. And at the same time, like I'm not worse off. Like I played professional sports, so I've got money in the bank and, but it put me in a lot of debt still, <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, unless you, unless you're fortunate enough to become an executive, which at this point is very rare because all of the companies are filled up with those executives until they die. Um, because the, the promise of being promoted to that level is not there. It doesn't exist. Um, because being an owner, I've seen it, right. It doesn't, it doesn't exist because there are so many holes you got to jump through to get there. Um, and half of it is people leaving. Like you need people yeah. to leave in order for you to get to those situations. Um, and if they don't, you're never going to get there. Um, you know, I think it teaches you some valuable life skills. Um, I'm a better person for it. Um, I know what I'm made out of, um, which in the working world for me, wasn't a thing because I only ever knew what I was made of when it came to putting on a pair of skates. I didn't know what I was made of in the working world. Cause I'd never like done it for a living. Um, and it really taught me what my worth is in like the American economy business system. Um, and I think it gave me a lot of, as an owner, it gave me a lot of insight into how like employees think and how they want to be treated and, you know, how to, how to run a successful company, regardless if you're an owner or not, like even if you're just in a management position. Um, but that was because I did it the right way. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I forced those things in when they wouldn't let me, um, and if you're not that type of person, which is a very like thin amount of people, they're just going to force you to do whatever you want. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get what you want out of it. Um, I don't regret it. I don't. Um, but I, I'm, I think I'm intelligent enough to know that like, I'm not like the majority. I'm a minority of person. And if you're a majority of person, like, don't do this. It doesn't matter what company it is. Like, as soon as you see some kind of like promotional levels where like, it's like super fast and they talk, talk to you about how much money you can make and stuff like just run the other way. Like don't do it because at the end of the day, the promise just definitely outweighs the outcome because they will, they will promise you Mount Everest and they will give you a molehill like at the end of the day. And I made money doing it. Like I did okay, but most people don't. And I don't want to see those people in those situations because I was fortunate enough that I had the money to actually be able to, to do it. Mm -hmm. If you've got $0 in your bank account, not a chance. 
you're you're already done. So just go work at McDonald's. And there's nothing wrong with working at McDonald's. I don't mean that as an insult because I don't. Right. They, they pay a living wage every day, which is what you you're owed as a person when you go to work every day. That's what you're owed. I don't care if you use a mop. I don't could care less if you dig holes for a living. You deserve a living wage every single day. And there are lots of parts of those companies that do not give you a living wage. Not even close. My my biggest thing is the recruiting has changed a lot and you need to be very, very careful. Anybody that's listening, you need to really pay attention and ask questions. And as soon as they're vague about anything, you need to not go to the interview because they are all taught, be super vague until you get them in the room. And then after that, then explains things to them, but don't give them everything. And then by the time they show up for their first day, they're not really sure what they're getting into. All that stuff is, is red flaggy and you need to not do that. Me, that was not a thing. I was upfront about everything. And that was one of the knocks against me was that Chase, you're too honest about stuff. I could care less. I would rather them not show up. <laughs> like That's I right. would, like I want the right people to show up. If they want a sales job, I want them in my door. Absolutely. I want them to know that it's sales. I want them to know that they need to work hard. And if that's not what they want and they just need a nine to fiver, this isn't for you, mm -hmm. right? And that was always a knock against me. Um, but it was always the recruiting method would always be super vague. When you get them on the phone, just tell them it's exciting and it's fun and the company's growing. Like, you know, all the buzzwords that mm -hmm. a lot of new companies use regardless. Like they use the same verbiage. Mm -hmm. And then you get off the phone and you're all excited to go to this interview and you don't even know what you're doing, right? And then you show up to the interview and then you leave and you still don't know what you're doing. Like, as far as I'm concerned, all of that is a problem. And if any of that happens, run the other way. Google is your friend. As soon as you get a phone and especially, oh my God, if you get a phone call from a company that you did not apply to, you can go to the interview. Because my thing was, is I would only have the people come in that applied to the company. If you did not apply for my job, I did not want you to work there because you don't know what we are. You're probably not going to do your due diligence. You're probably not going to look up what we do. And then you're not really going to understand it. And then you're probably going to end up quitting anyways. That's not the type of person I want working for me. I want them to know what's going on and how it operates. Um, and again, that was another knock on me. It was like, well, if they apply, like there are a lot, that was always the same line. There are lots of people that don't even know about this that will do really well. Like what? <laughs> no, you apply for the jobs you want. You know what I mean? And, and the tough part is, is there are so many people that apply for jobs that don't even remember. And they, they, they'll they tell you, well, yeah, no, you applied for this. But if you go back in your email, you've never applied for that job, right? Um, so just be very, very careful about that stuff because that that's how they get you. And, and now, because obviously we all know the gold standard for recruiting right now um, is, is LinkedIn. LinkedIn, indeed. And ZipRecruiter, all of those are the gold standards of recruiting. If they're on any of those, make sure you report them because yes. Indeed does not support those companies. Correct. Right? So my company, right? I got special permission from Indeed. I literally knew an account manager hmm. and I literally told them the practices that we were doing. And I told them the way that I outlined it and I gave him a business plan. And they gave me special permission to be on Indeed. On Indeed, hmm. all the other companies they're normally not doing that because there are certain guidelines that you have to meet in order to be on Indeed. And a lot of these companies don't like you're not supposed to mass recruit. You're definitely not supposed to be posting ads every single day. Like all that stuff is not okay with Indeed. And these companies do it all the time. So they change their names. They change how many times they post. All that stuff. If any of that looks fishy, make sure you report them because they're not supposed to be doing it. Zip recruiter, same thing, right? LinkedIn, same thing. Like the, your, there are certain guidelines when you sign up your company, when you read like the policies and the terms and agreements, mm -hmm. and there's a whole list of things you're not supposed to be doing, right? And I was told by Indeed, like when you go on here, as long as you don't abuse these things, and as long as you follow the business plan that you gave us, we're not going to have an issue. The problem is, is most of the companies, they don't get that training and they don't care. And they just post, 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 post all the time. And they just keep posting and Indeed has a hard time tracking everything. Right. So things slip through the cracks. If you see that stuff, report them immediately. Because at the end of the day, the only way we can get these companies, because it's not so much I even want them to go out of business. I just want them to change. 
you need mm -hmm. to stop doing what you're doing and do something different because it's not, it's not okay. Cause all you're doing is benefiting the top and you're destroying people's lives at the bottom, right? Like my life isn't destroyed, but there are people that you've talked to that I've watched interviews of and their lives were in shambles at some point. And that's not okay. Right. Because there's a lot of moving parts of this, especially when you get to ownership that like financially can really mess you up like yeah. really bad. <laughs> right. And I don't want that. I just want them to change. It's not that I feel like they need to go out of business. Maybe some of them do because there are a couple that probably just need to go away. Um, but we definitely, they need to change the way that they practice. Um, and they have this illusion that it works. It's always going to work because people always need jobs. It's like, no, you just enjoy screwing people over. Right. Um, that's my biggest thing is I just want people to be conscious of that and, and report them because they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And there are lots of companies legitimately that those posts are being taken away from because they're paying to have it at the top. So it looks like it's a legitimate place to work, but it's not. Right. Um, and that's really the biggest thing. Cause I think, you know, if you go back and watch, you know, even before Dan, there's lots of videos obviously on your channel and, you know, people have said so many different things and I don't want to repeat those things, but that's really my biggest thing is just, if you see them report them, and be very weary of the vagueness because they all want to do it regardless of where there are. doesn't matter what company it is. So um, yeah, that's, that's my last finishing thought I would say.